Well, good afternoon. It has been, uh, well, it's been a few weeks and uh, <laughs> man, it, oh, it feels kind of weird uh, getting back on the air here. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we had a little little summer downtime and uh, with uh, a few things uh, interspersed and uh, uh, coming back uh, fresh, ready to go. Um, you probably uh, Notice some of the uh, the lovely faces of uh, Peter Erskine and Matt Kerr, Carr. Now I really yeah. care. Carr, <laughs> Kerr. See, you know, see, I still can't get it right, Mac, after how many years. But anyhow, um, we, we're, we're really excited. And today, uh, what better topic to come back with? Uh, Pete goes, hey, I think we should come back with working in a COVID world, right? And uh, I was like, Okay, there you go. And, and um, uh, you know, today we'll, we're going to be chatting with Firehouse and, uh, and, and Mark and Vinny, who you see on the screen right now. But before we go there uh, and jump into that discussion, we got to have the, the Q&A, you know, primer. So, Mac, I, this has always been your, your, your world. Um, it's been a few weeks, so I think I need some reminders on uh on how to do it but also just you know maybe as the audience is uh connecting up uh uh walk us through um some notes on uh best practices here well in your little go to webinar uh um control panel there there's a pull down menu that says questions and in there you can enter your question um be specific in your question because the presentation will continue to flow on. And when we get to your question, it may not immediately come to mind what you're talking about unless you are clear in your question so that we can uh, address that topic and correctly that you're interested in. So please be succinct in your questions so that we'll understand them. Also, uh, it, the question window is not a chat window. Other attendees will not see your questions, uh, but we will all see the questions. Um, we will answer them live on screen. We may not get to every single question, but we will certainly get to every single topic. Um, so if we don't get to yours specifically, I hope we cover you, your topic. That's well, really... But the, yeah. but the questions drive the experience. So do ask questions. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, uh, this topic particular, um, you know, Pete, when, you know, the experiences that, that, that you shared um, uh, over the past uh, summer working on some different projects, you know, I think one of the things that really brought to mind here is we've been, we've been doing audio for, a very long time you know you add up the five of us and there's a couple of weeks of uh of experience right so we know how to make sound you know um uh mark and vinnie with firehouse you guys uh you know most recently i saw a few of your uh um you know some some articles around sound design for the nba bubble and how to how to deal with you know i, I saw another thing in sports video uh or uh, with um how to how to create sound when there is no sound for the broadcast uh, uh, audience. You know, that stuff, while complex and difficult and a lot of different opinions, uh, almost is pretty easy, right? We've got this pile of gear. We've got this, this broad experience. Now, all of a sudden, they go, how do we keep people safe, right? And just that phrase alone, right? How do you define safe, right? I mean, there's... There's all this, and and now take something that's already complex, layer that on top, and uh, you know this is a uh, uh, you know a pretty big topic. And and Pete, do you have any thoughts before we jump into this conversation with it? Because you've had you know some experiences. Well, the, uh, Kelly and I have been out for like five weeks. We just got back a, a week ago, um, and working. Uh, we were basically on a five city a five city tour, and if you are in touch with what we do you know what five cities and what we did but the important thing is our conversation centered around when are you getting test sets in this when's your next test where do you go should we go do we get it before we go to the venue how many days will this test last what is it what color wristband are you wearing 
no talk about audio or comms. It was it, it's like crazy. So that was this new the new normal, I think, you know. That was the interesting thing with the NBA. The NBA was from an audio standpoint and a communication standpoint, one of the most complex projects we've ever done in our lives with mm -hmm. the least production time involved on that. Throw on top of that uh, the COVID issues, problems, questions, being the first real large scale show during a global pandemic to happen uh, made simple things phenomenally frustrating. And uh, it, it took it to a level where, you know, you were saying you didn't talk much about audio. We were certainly talking about audio nonstop mm -hmm. because what we were doing was, although audio new for lots of people and solving all kinds right. of broadcast in arena problems, things like that, but dealing being completely overshadowed by this covid conversation and uh uh that took it to a level that you know stress was certainly very very high um and uh it, normally people are stressed out on gigs and you know loading in and lighting guys in the way and that's not where my rigging point was and those things that's a level of stress we're all very used to we know how to deal with it maybe we get angry maybe we don't even care but you throw something like a health and safety thing like COVID on top of that and people behave very, very differently. Um, and that made that, that just took it to a level. Uh, I, I would not be interested in going through that again. Um, being, I don't wanna say pioneering, but uh, the audio was pioneering and new and that was awesome. Uh, the COVID stuff we went through and the production did a stunningly good job, but there's a learning curve, especially when you're the first people doing stuff. And uh, uh, I don't know that I would want to go through that again. That was a very difficult experience uh, for everyone. And I left early. You know, Vinny was down there for, what, 108 days or something like that. Yeah, um, and I will point out, we, we started that project, uh, you know, it was in talks, you know, back in March, right, when everything shut down. And it's you're talking to a client about, well, what are we going to do to keep everyone safe? Because you're talking about comms, which every department, every person is going to have a headset or you're going to have a microphone. It's like, well, what do you do? I mean, even the knowledge back then that the CDC had was to the best of their understanding uh, of the virus and how it was to spread. And, and, and we put together a team of, of, uh, of those of us at, at Firehouse who, and, and, and we said, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to come back, you know, with, with, there's, there's no, you yeah. know, it, it, there's no hard data to lean on. Right. Uh, yeah. And that, and I guess, um, you know, and that's, a, uh, this is a great entry point into the letting you guys walk us through that. And, and in setting that up, you know, I think the few things I'd like to encourage everybody that's a part of this or watching at a later time or whatever it is, take this information with that very understanding that Vinny brought up. These are, this is CDC guidance, right? These are, these are scientists that every day are discovering something new, okay? So if you're looking for this concrete, okay, this is how it's going to be done, and now I can just forget about that. Well, forget about that, because that's not what it's going to be. And to me, one of the exciting opportunities we have here is to find a way forward, right? One step at a time. It's going to be hard, as, as Mark, as you pointed out, that it's, take a difficult job and then make it even more difficult, right? Yeah. But I appreciate you guys coming on and talking about this experience because it's about saying, how do we keep moving forward? This isn't going anywhere, all right? It's it's not gonna magically end after elections as some people may have hoped. It's not gonna magically end even when, you know, good talk of vaccine happens. It's gonna magically end when it's gone, all right? But between now and then, we're going to keep moving forward and we're going to try and figure out how do we do this safely, best practices. So I think that's what today is about, is about talking about best practices, w walking through with you guys, CDC guidelines, things you've learned that you're, you're able to share with us. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll look for some questions, but uh, I think we'll hand it off to these guys uh, uh, to start walking us through. When something just occurred to me, that is an aspect of this, which is is a major component is the latency in getting tested and approved you can't just say if somebody gets sick on a site oh we'll go get so-and-so he'll come in and take over this afternoon you can't do that you've got to have plans in advance and people tested in advance who can fill in on a moment's notice i'm sure the that 
that's I, I I've got a part of that that I'll touch on. <clears throat> the NBA had a way that we dealt with that. Um, let me just start from the top here. <clears throat> um, uh, Kelly, you you touched on this, but uh, none of this is legal or medical advice. Uh, we have experience doing some shows. Uh, we are not doctors. We are not lawyers. Uh, we are none of those things. Uh, we have been in show environments on a lot of things. We've been on some bigger productions, the NBA being by far the largest. Uh, we've done some small stuff and we've seen uh, a wide variety of protocols and safety standards from uh, the NBA, which was sort of the gold standard, uh, all the way down to people who don't care about anything and won't even wear masks. So I've, I've seen in the past five months, I've seen the gambit of things. Um, CDC, state, union guidelines, all of those things are changing all of the time. So uh, if you watch this in a month, if you watch this whenever, it, all of it could have changed. They are doing research. Viral research usually lasts years, not months. Uh, so uh, things that we are doing now may not be relevant. You know, there's arguments that some of the things we're doing now are, uh, are not necessary and just make people feel comfortable, which is another area. Uh, I'll touch on too, but I, but I want to be very clear that uh, uh, we are doing the best that we can to keep our teams safe, to keep artists safe, to keep people that we are working with safe, but that none of this is 20 years of research by medical professionals saying you absolutely do this, you absolutely do that. Uh, what I'm hoping in this forum is we need to get more people talking. Um, I have, in, in the various shows that I've been doing, I talk to producers, I talk to clients, and they don't even know basics, uh, or, or some of them know everything, but the, the knowledge base is so scattered and fragmented. Um, and usually the difference between someone who has done one show in the COVID world and no shows, uh, those first three, four, five days a week of doing production is a huge learning curve. And uh, everyone I've seen now, several productions stumble on the same things and they get it and they move forward and it's great, but it's, uh, uh, it's very awkward. So I think the more people in the industry that are talking, we certainly have very limited government uh, saying you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. They're just like, uh, okay, don't get together and do a show. But, but there's things that we can do. So um uh, I'm happy to get the conversation going. I'm I'm excited to be talking about some of these and hearing some questions, but I can't emphasize enough that uh, uh, none of this is 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 medical legal. Uh, as uh, Vinny's got a great presentation he's going to do that gets pretty technical uh, about UV, about sterilization, and things like that. That is stuff that an awesome team of guys at our company took time and really did a deep dive into, but none of them are doctors, none of them are lawyers. So it's our best ability to come up with real things that actually protect our crew and actually protect things, uh, the people around us. Uh, a big part early on was not just saying, oh, we're gonna go out and buy bleach, but how do we prove that whatever we decide to do is actually working. And there was an, there was an interesting process there of, uh, you know, the number of times we pick up a shackle and it says two tons on it and you say, oh, it's good for two tons. Well, probably, but until it's proved, you know, has it been dropped a hundred times? Was it hit by a hammer? Is it, well, same thing with the COVID world. You can't just say, oh, I, I hit it with this sanitizer. The bottle says 99% effective. Uh, a lot of what we were looking into is how do you prove that what you're doing is actually doing something? A part, um, of, a part of the shows we worked on, Kelly and I, and even Mac, uh, the producers hired doctors to be part of the team. And they told us what we had to do to make everybody safe. Now, we, of course, implemented certain things on top of that, but but there was, there was, it's very important to have that doctor part of it in your team. Correct. And, you know, with part of that, uh, sadly, you know, I've sat in many, many meetings, I would say hours of meetings at this point with doctors. Uh, and like the CDC and like the unions, guidelines change. You know, what they said in, uh, August is different than what they say now, is different than what they're going to say in January, is different than what they're going to say in May. So uh, making sure that you have... Information. 
Correct. And and making sure that uh, there are minimum standards uh, that we feel make us safe. But then again, this is just an opinion of something that our company is doing to try as best we can to keep people safe. Um, so uh, there's uh, there's a lot of sides of this topic. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to get into the details of what we did on the NBA. Uh, I, I sort of I think that is the highest version of what anyone will do. They certainly uh, spent a lot of money to try to make sure that everyone was safe. But there's there's from my standpoint, there are uh, several layers of dealing with the COVID problem. There are laws, regulations, and union guidelines is sort of a step one. As laws are passed, those are things that we have to follow. If they say only 20 people are allowed in and your producer lets 50 people in, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to walk out on the gig? Are you going to complain? Or are you just going to sit there and, and do the gig? Uh, traveling guidelines, this is a hugely gray area of I am booked on this gig. It is in New York State. New York State, and I realize they just updated their rules, has you know, testing X number of days sitting there, testing, and then you're good. For a while, it was 14 days. People not paying attention to that. Oh, I live in uh, uh, I live in Vermont. I'm just going to drive down. Um, and how how that relates to laws and whose responsibility is it? Is everyone going to sit there and go, oh, uh, I know this guy drove in from here uh, and say something? Are people just going to be quiet and not say anything? Um, I have seen it across the board. There are one of the biggest problems I see in doing shows is there are people that think that this virus is going to wipe out the world and they can't step outside their apartment. And there are people that think it is a giant hoax and masks are stupid and they can't breathe. And everything in between I see all the time on shows. Um, and when you have a person who is very nervous about it and wants to work and needs to work because obviously monetarily people are in big trouble now so they're more apt to do risky things than they would normally but uh, a guy who's nervous finds out that someone drove up from from philadelphia to do a new york gig well technically there's a quarantine law there so you know people are in their rights to say things um it's it's a very murky very awkward very adversarial uh environment to be in where uh People are trying to get gigs, but they're also breaking laws. But the law changed since you were booked to the gig. Um, uh, you're traveling, you're driving, you're flying, you're taking the train. Um, it's uh, it's it's an added layer of stress. On you know, we haven't even gotten to the gig. We haven't even gotten to protocols yet, and how people get there and what gigs they accept is uh, sort of the first step in dealing with those changing guidelines. Um, uh, a lot of laws and places require a version of gloves, masks, face shields, things like that. That is also changing um, uh, in related to uh, laws and, and guidelines. I know the uh, the SAG after thing has, uh, you know, face shields when dealing with talent, things like that. I bet a lot of people don't realize, you know, they either haven't read that paper. That paper is not law and not every show is a SAG after union show. So again, lots of people have opinions about, well, I don't need to follow that rule. I do need to follow that rule. Is it even worthwhile? Um, uh, the, the variances make it uh, uh, difficult. Um, the next layer is things that, so that's things that are legally required. Then we move on to things that actually keep you safe, which is not necessarily the same as the things above. Uh, there's plenty of things we do in production that keep, you know, wearing a helmet absolutely keeps you safe. Uh, having three guys around a two foot tall step ladder, making sure it doesn't move. Uh, it's an OSHA thing, but, you know, how safe does that keep you? Um, I think in the COVID world, there is lots of questions about, oh, that, you know, people get into the argument of it's not surface transmittable. And I'm not saying that it is not. I'm just saying that people... There is documentation saying, oh, you can't get it from a surface. Other stuff says you can. Well, if you can't get it from a surface, why are we spending millions of dollars surface spraying and wiping down and UVing? So the question is, is that actually keeping you safe? I think there is good documentation that masks actually keep you safe and that real masks uh, actually keep you safe, you know, medical grade masks and things like that. 
Um, so figuring out things that uh, that that really do something. Testing, you know, testing obviously can keep you safe. If someone has tested positive, you do not want them on site. But different tests yield different results. You know, a PCR test versus a rapid test um, versus if you're testing every single day. Uh, it, it is obviously true that the more you test, you know, there is a percent possibility of false positives. The more you test, the better a chance that you will have a false positive. Um, I'll get into it in the future, but uh, we, uh, on the NBA, we did have a couple of false positives and followed our protocols immediately when that happened because you don't know until follow-up testing has happened if it's a false positive. So testing is something that can actually keep you safe provided it's the right kind of test. Also provided everyone is tested. If you show up on a gig where production says everyone is tested and all the truck drivers show up and none of them are tested and they're walking around and the tent company shows up to put the tent down and because they're considered a different part of the production and not the tech crew, they aren't tested. You know, you can you can poke holes in your your instant bubble uh, very quickly. So uh, um, that's another problem with what actually keeps you safe. I think testing is great, um, but it is not absolute. Uh, um, another layer, and this we learned very quickly on the NBA, is things that make people feel safe psychologically. The psychological side of this is huge. People have been locked in their apartments. People can't go out to bars and restaurants and hang out with their friends. Uh, they get on site, they lose their mind a little bit. Um, they want to hang out and sit and have lunch with their friends. And at the same time, they think they're going to get COVID because they're around 100 people. So things that we do uh, that are very visual and very obvious that we are uh, cleaning and doing things, they are effective tools, but I also think they are very effective in showing that we are doing things. Things like, and this probably should have been happening for years, but you know, no one's sharing intercom headsets. An intercom headset, you get it for the run of the show and you keep it, you don't throw it back in a pile of stuff. Um, uh, we do a fair amount of stuff with UV, uh, be it the UV lockers, you know, easy bake ovens as, as they're nicknamed now, or uh, uh, UV lights over intercom panels, things like that. UV is great because A, it is phenomenally effective as, as Vinny will get into later, um, but it also is something that people can actually see. They can see that there is a UV light. They can see that microphones are put in a locker and cleaned at the end of the night. Um, and that is great for morale. When, when you see a crew person uh, handing out a mic in gloves and a face shield, that is showing that we are taking it seriously, as opposed to just, oh, let me go run and grab that out of the tray and, and throw it to someone real quick. When they, uh, this was a retraining on the NBA for the crew of, you know, a producer says, hey, give me an RF, I wanna talk to people. You're used to running back, grabbing it out of the tray, running out and throwing it. And it's like, hold on, we got a glove up, give us a minute. It's going to take an extra minute to make that happen. It comes back in. It needs to get cleaned because the producer isn't the person that was going to use it for real. It slows things down, but it also shows that you're taking it seriously. Um, there are a lot of people that aren't taking this seriously. And I think that hurts the industry. The more that people see that, that everyone is taking it seriously, the better chance more and more events have, and we're probably a long way from audiences, but there's plenty of television taping, webinars, all kinds of things that people can be doing for work. And if everyone takes this seriously to some some minimum levels, uh, people will be more comfortable with, uh, with doing things. Um, uh, let me see here. What is practical is sort of the last part of this. There are lots of things we can do. They all cost money. Um, you know, the, the easier side of it, masks and social distancing. Uh, sadly, in the United States and the entertainment industry, I, I personally consider masks and social distancing as the ground floor. That is the base of doing a safe show. And lots of people can't get that part right. Uh, they go outside and uh, they, they go to lunch and they sit with four or five people at the table. Uh, they go to the bar right after the show. Thank God I can finally get my mask off and go to the bar and sit down. Um, uh, 
they have their mask down half the time um, on uh, their uh, on their face at the gig. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that makes it very challenging because when you haven't even done step one, uh, it's tough to do uh, step two, three, and four. Um, uh, sorry, let me scroll down a little bit here. Uh, testing um, is, is a great and effective thing, but uh, it's expensive. Um, uh, testing everyone before a gig is expensive. Do you pay their wages? Do you not pay their wages? Uh, how long does it take to get a test back? Are you doing a test that is effective? Are you doing a rapid test that has a high error rate? Are you not? Um, uh, timing it, you know, if a guy's going from one gig to another, uh, time to get there. Um, my experience has been lots of exceptions are made uh, to the testing rule. When someone says, oh, we're going to test everyone, and then they start saying, oh, well, that person does, oh, they're just in for four hours, oh, they're just doing this. Um, uh, another thing, and we, we were able to do this on the NBA, is spare crew. If you are testing and you are on site for a long time, uh, you are going to get positives. If you get positives, you have to pull the crew out, and yet you have to do the show. So are you adding crew to make it so you can rotate out when people test positive? Uh, that is obviously very expensive to do across multiple departments. Um, uh, Vinny, if you want to go for a second, uh, I'm actually on show site and uh, I just had someone reach out to me that I need to get back to. So give me one second here to, uh, to answer that. Sure. Well, there's a couple of questions here that we're looking at anyway. Uh, so, it's a good time to sort of uh, bridge that before we deep dive on what we've done. So uh, I get a question that says on the, on the projects that we've worked on during COVID, uh, how are safety protocols implemented with local labor? And uh, I'll say the the answer to that, in, in my experience, uh, has been, that's been a toss up. Uh, there hasn't been a standard protocol for what labor has done on, on, on some shows. They're testing no one and on some shows they're testing only people that are coming in for show call so uh labor is an x factor uh for sure and even on some union shows uh, we've experienced unions uh, in certain states saying hey there's no mask mandate in this state we don't we don't have, we're not wearing a mask so uh that 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 lends itself to what i'm going to talk through is the protocol that we came up with that uh, we started first and foremost and said, what's going to make us feel safe on site? You know, knowing what we know uh, and seeing what we see, we have to first take a measure uh, that's going to protect uh, us, our crew, our, in a sense, uh, group that we're working with. So it, it, the mindset was, what can we do to protect our, our group of people? And then let's expand that and extrapolate it to say everyone then that we're going to give a headset to. We want to, we want to put, provide that same level of, of protection uh, to anyone that we're going to hand a, a piece of hardware, whether it's comms or whether it's a mic or in ears or an ISD or what have you. So uh, that was, that was the, that was the first thing. And, and the second question here sort of dovetails into that, which says, are, are there basic protocols that are consistent across all shows? So masks, distancing, hygiene, testing, tracing. Um, and again, the, the answer to that has been no, in my experience, and I, I'm sure Mark will say the same, we've seen, we've seen the gamut. And because there's really no federal protocol and no consistent state protocol, uh, and, and you know, any, anyone who's doing productions knows you come in and you're like your own entity for a, a time period. So there's, there's, no, there's no standard. And that's sort of why uh, what we sought to do was do something that we felt would protect us no matter what uh, was going to happen with the, with, right. with the, with the yeah. rest of production. The scary thing for me on that is I have actually done shows where people refuse to wear masks and were angry and I'm not going to say violent, but were aggressive about you can't make me wear a mask. Um, and that very quickly gets to the, are we going to walk off the show? You know, is this, is this a safe environment? Uh, we all know there's, there's the, the Grammy awards and top tier productions and there's, uh, you know, bottom, bottom of the barrel stuff. There's a, a tiny stage that we see stuff on Facebook falling apart and a trust that's falling over and there's still events and people still get hired to them and everything in between. And it's, uh, 
it's it's nerve wracking and you know for us to try to figure out what's the uh you know at what point is it just unsafe to be around um yeah, so i guess here's a question i have for you around these two these two questions because i think you've posed it very well there um the you you it sounds like you determined a minimum level of safety for your team right um yeah. that that in some in some ways layers on top of whatever protocols you're given right so in this description it's like okay whether there are some or there are none or they're the most yours still layer on top of that to maybe perhaps fill in any gaps if there were any do you do you think it's the producers where in an ideal world where do you think the direction comes from mark for us with you know, especially folks that are on here that are going to be talking to their clients who are saying hey we're going to con you know we we want to contract you to do this show uh, do is, where does that fit right that request I, it's if we're talking about the upper levels or the medium levels of production. I think uh, it, it, you've got to you've got to eliminate the bottom levels of stuff because it's going to be the wild west on uh, on smaller gigs. Um, I think most producers that I talk to, I say, what are your COVID protocols? If they have done a show in the COVID world, they usually will come right back with, okay, masks, social distancing, probably testing, um, not not absolutely guaranteed, but that is a more common than less common. Um, uh, COVID compliance officers on site, uh, things like that. Um, uh, if they haven't done a show, it's, uh, oh yeah, 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 well, you know, they think it's easier than it is. Um, and, and testing, um, uh, I'll get into the specifics of what the NBA did, but you know, the uh, testing is tough. You know, to think, oh, I'm just going to send six guys off to get a test. Well, what kind of test are you going to have them get? How fast are you going to get the results? Um, are you going to test multiple times during the day? Uh, are you going to have the results back on the test before they show up on site? Um, are you going to use a web portal? Uh, there's some interesting technologies that are that are appearing around this um, that are making things a lot easier. But in the beginning, it was certainly tough uh, to prove that you have a positive test. Um, I've been to many places where I tested, they couldn't find the information They're like, oh yeah, just go on, you know, it, it, it'll be okay. And I'm like, uh, actually, no, I don't wanna go in if I'm not on your list uh, because that's me taking the personal responsibility to protect my crew, the production, people like that. And uh, there's a lot of personal responsibility in this. If you don't feel safe, if you don't care about other people, uh, it's going to be a very different experience than uh, people who are into it and following guidelines and and, and things like that. Um, let me let me touch on real quick here with what the NBA did um, and and how they got there. <coughs> um, I it it's where we've sort of gotten the template and a lot of other shows uh, have have pulled things out of there for um, for how to work. Uh, it did not start this way. When we uh, when we went down there, one of the the funniest slash most frustrating things about designing the NBA, and I will use the example of the front of house locations and the tech table. Uh, we have all been designing shows for decades at this point, and and the set designers and all these people. This isn't groups of people that are just jumping into production brand new. So. On a tech table, you know, every three feet you have a person. Uh, you smash them all in there, they work, everyone's, it's great. Uh, in the COVID world, everyone's got to be spread out. And we would do drawings, and it's so easy to drift back to what you're doing. It's so easy to want to have your mask off. It's so easy to pull it down for a drink and not put it back up. It's so easy for someone to say, everyone must be social distanced. And by the third version of the drawing, you've got 19 people in an area that you should have six. And we went through rotations of a drawing would come up. We're all looking on Zoom, which is now Zoom teams. I love having production meetings that way. That I think is a good thing that has come out of this COVID world. But we're, we're looking at things and moving this around and move that and oh, can that move a foot over there? And then someone will go, oh, what about social distancing? 
and it's like, crap, okay, close the program. We're gonna have to find new areas because we added a pyro guy, we added to this, we added to that, spread everyone back out, come back the next day, start over, start the rotation again. It's with all of these things, it's very easy to forget and go back to what we have been doing for 20 years. When we loaded the NBA in, the producer actually came out and gave a pretty cool speech. He said, I need everyone to work slower. We have spent 20, 30, 40 years working harder and faster and, and get stuff in and get set up on the first day and uh, put six people on a cable and run it really fast. And he said, I want the opposite. I want to go slower. If a video wall normally hangs with four people, I want two hanging it. If a cable normally has eight guys on it, I want two on it and I want you to spend all day doing it. And it was interesting because it's literally the opposite of what we're trained to do. And everyone drifts back to it. Our team, <clears throat> absolutely A-list crew that we had down there top to bottom. And they're all alpha, hardworking, like get out of my way, we're gonna get this thing loaded in one day. It's hard, and that's, that's rock and roll, that's entertainment. That's a lot of the industry, it draws that kind of person to slow those people down, to say, you know what, spread out. You can hang a speaker cluster with two people. You don't need four people hopped around on it. It just goes slower. It's it's tough. It's against what we're literally trained and, and disciplined to do. It's against, it's against the personality type. Um, I mean, I know I can unleash Vinny on an intercom system and three hours later, if with no other help, he's got 90% of it up. Um, but that's not the COVID world. That's not a safe appropriate thing. Now that needs to take six or eight hours. And for producers, that means more money, more money. All of this costs more money to go slower, to go safer, to go spread out, to do COVID testing. Um, so the uh, the NBA, uh, we went down and started load in, in a, uh, uh, with testing, but not uh, and and basic safety protocols, but not heavy monitoring. Um, the amount of time from when the gig got confirmed to load in uh, was about three weeks. Uh, we had been doing advanced work prior to that, but from the time they actually had a load in date to the time we loaded in was about three weeks. So the IT, the testing, all of this stuff um, was very challenging for them to put up city permits all of these uh, these things that normally you spend months working on uh, had to be done very quickly. So testing was tough. You know, today you're testing over here, tomorrow you're testing there, you get an email every day. Um, we had long conversations on Zoom with doctors from Harvard explaining things, and then two days later it would be modified. Um, and it's frustrating, guys would get very frustrated. Well, we were told this yesterday, why are we being told this today? Well, we're on the leading edge of this pandemic. We've all been locked in our apartments for three months. Um, uh, it's it's easy to get wound up, and especially when you're told we're doing this, and then the next day we're doing this, and then the next day we're doing this. And it was uh, them trying to figure out, you know, a smooth workflow. How do we smooth this out? How do you test, I don't know, a thousand people a day or two thousand people a day uh, is is a big effort. <clears throat> So we started load in in uh, uh, hotels that were open to the public, but obviously we had our own rooms and trying to social distance. And it was very weird uh, to travel down uh, some people via planes, some people via trains, some people via cars, whatever the personal comfort levels were, um, and start loading in. Uh, then within a week and a half, we sort of split and uh, Two thirds of the team, we split into what they called green and yellow. Uh, green is inside the arena, court access. You can be near the players, things like that. Yellow is high television cameras, upper decks of the arena and the TV compound. So when we made that split, um, uh, our guys, uh, myself and Vinny included, uh, had to be locked in a hotel room for seven days. Uh, if you have never done that, that's an experience. Um, and we tried to do lots of things to keep guys engaged in it. Uh, yoga classes, one of our guys is a CrossFit instructor. Um, uh, lunch on Zoom, you know, things to try to keep people engaged. But seven days in your hotel room with no outside contact is, uh, is tough. Um, 
but that was at the time what the NBA felt was necessary to keep us safe, and they wanted to err on the side of caution. Um, uh, that was daily testing. You know, people in basically hazmat suits would show up to your door and knock on your door and test you, and uh, uh, you had to have seven concurrent tests in a row. When we were on the other side of that, daily testing continued all the way through. We could just go down to the testing. Um, every day you had a pulse oximeter and a thermometer that was tied Bluetooth connected to your phone, which had an app on it, which automatically logged information. Uh, you had a band on your wrist that would scan you in and out of locations and would let them know the medical status of your tests as you tried to get on the bus to go to the gig, as you tried to get into the gig, things like that. So contact tracing was real. They had uh, a device that we wore in our credentials that was a proximity sensor. Um, if you were within six feet of another person wearing a device, it started beeping um, and it logged who you were with. Uh, that was maddening. Uh, you'd go over to talk to someone and it would start beeping and then you take a step back and you take a step back. And the interesting thing, uh, the job I'm on now is a bunch of guys that were down in that bubble and watching them get together to talk they're now subliminally trained that they're actually standing six feet apart because they've had this beeper that for three months was telling them when they were too close to each other. So um, that's, you know, that's a, a retraining thing. But um, uh, certainly masks, sanitizing, social distancing, uh, medical site was on staff. Um, we had uh, groups of, of uh, teams that worked. Um, we had teams of six that would do a game um, and that team worked and stayed together. Um, if any member of a team tested positive, the entire team would be pulled. Um, a, a interesting issue that came up is this is medical data. Uh, medical data is private. You don't get to, uh, you know, a, a producer or a group of people don't just get random access to your testing data. Um, uh, me as the project manager on the gig, uh, or the account manager on the gig can't get access to medical data. So if someone tested positive, the doctor would call that person and send them back to the room. We wouldn't necessarily get, well, we wouldn't get notified by the NBA because that's breaking HIPAA laws. So what we told our crew is if you get tested positive and you get pulled, you can call us and let us know and we will proactively pull the rest of the team to protect everyone else or you can choose not to it is it is absolutely your choice to keep your medical information private um we would find out the following day when that person didn't show up to work but they don't have to tell us now because uh it's a it's a tight group of guys <clears throat> we did have two false positives um which which triggered the the protocol um, and they immediately called and said, hey, I, uh, uh, I tested positive, I'm out. We immediately called the rest of the members of the team, sent them back to their rooms, and the swing team went in and did the game that night. Um, the problem with all of this is all of those things that I just listed are probably in the millions of dollars of costs to do. So it was a good first step for doing a production, but a lot of those things from a financial standpoint are not necessarily practical uh, in the real world. Maybe a television studio that has very tight control of their people daily or staff that is always coming in. But most gigs we're talking about, Pete, uh, your gig was you know a couple weeks long with the same team moving around, but most gigs are a week, a week and a half. That's sort of normal. You're probably not gonna be seeing any touring for a long time. So you've got to figure most gigs are in the one, two, three to five or seven day category. And that's, there's no time to set all of those things up. Um, uh, which, yeah. which takes us to, you know, okay, what are minimum safe standards? Um, so go ahead, Vinny. Yeah. Well, if I, I mean, yeah, Mark touched on a, a macro view uh, and, and obviously the situation in the NBA was extreme because it was one of the first gigs back. And of course, nobody wanted to have that first gig back that was in the limelight and, and failed. So they, they went to 
uh, every measure uh, to their credit it, it worked perfectly but we, we we have been able to synthesize now coming out on the back end uh, a concept of what we think is going to be sort of bare minimum and we've got a couple of questions here mark uh, you know so the first one says usually in a show safety meeting the crew is cautioned if you see something say something uh, how about when a person comes on set without a mask what should someone do particularly if they won't wear a mask you know i I don't know that there's a lot you can do. If they have a COVID uh, uh, compliance officer on the show, obviously you can you can take your complaint there rather than confront a person directly. But uh, you know what I'm going to dig into the protocol that we came up with is again it's based on keeping us safe, uh, at, regardless of what others are going to do, because you you just can't control. Um, what others are going to do. I, I, I don't know, Mark, if you want to add anything to that. But that that's yeah, that's my so the COVID compliance officer is uh, is the new position. Um, and my experience has been uh, there is the OSHA safety guy who gives his little speech and then the COVID compliance officer gives his little speech. Some of them are spectacular. Uh, we've done shows with guys who are really on it and uh, in my opinion, they set the tone. The producers and the COVID compliance officer sets the tone. If they let 20 people walk around with chin bras on, uh, you, you've lost it. Um, and I have firsthand experience with if a crew person, like if myself tells someone to put a mask on, that gets very aggressive very quickly. Um, and uh, the COVID compliance officer is the good intermediate level, uh, you know, the, the buffer in there, but there's lots of shows that do not have COVID compliance officers. Um, and uh, an interesting side note for people who are, you know, looking for a gig and don't have gigs, uh, my understanding is it's an online training uh, class that you take, uh, and then you're a COVID compliance officer, and there are certainly lots of them being hired. That is a very in-demand uh, uh, field, but it's, uh, it's very aggravating um, and it shouldn't be, but you know, it, we are all aware the country is very divided on lots of things. And this is another thing that the country is very divided on. I don't think people argue about safe rigging or things like that, nearly like they argue about, uh, do I need a mask on or um, walking around with a water bottle in their hand all the time and that's the reason why their mask is off because i'm drinking and and i've seen people doing this it's uh well i'm allowed to have my mask down while i'm drinking so i'm just going to spend all day with a water bottle in my hand um it's uh it's tough it's this is a very you know i wish audio was the problems that we were dealing with um uh, the next next question here before we move forward says uh, I'm assuming that for the NBA uh, that the NBA had an OB truck and it was okay because it was in the bubble. Uh, how have you seen other OB trucks set up? Seems not possible to distance. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean the NBA they they had OB trucks, they had several trucks, and uh, they were also in a different tier. So uh, larger shows are definitely going to need to use a tiered system where you're going to have a, a zone for. Uh, crew that's in contact with talent and a zone for crew that is not in contact with talent and in, in likely when we see an audience come back there'll be a red zone that is audience zone that is not in contact with either um, i haven't seen that yet but i i think that's going to be coming but uh in terms of other events what i've seen you know they're going to have a, a a broadcast truck an ob an ob fan they're going to have any position that can be remoted remoted yeah. you know if that's a video switcher or if that's a producer or whoever that is those positions, you're going to you're gonna have the essentials in the truck, the people that need to be there to operate physical devices that cannot be remoted, and then everyone else is, is pretty much going to be remoted. Uh, the show that I'm sitting at right now. A couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, an a award show, music award show, and instead of a single, it was separated into lots of venues all over the city. Instead of one OB van, there were two. Half the people that normally in the van were moved into the second one. So instead of four people in the front row, you had a director and a and a TD. That was it. Yeah. Or gel codes. You know, they'll break people out with positions exactly. into separate gel codes, things of that nature. The the show I'm at right now, uh, the audio guy and maybe the TD are in the truck, and everyone else is inside the convention center, remoted uh, um, out. So they're they're doing what they can to keep the trucks as uh, as empty as possible. 
Um, a lot of producers are staying at home and being on the end of remote comm links. Uh, we've certainly done way more uh, remote comms than any other time in my life. Um, but yeah, the uh, uh, you can't pack, you know, you can't put people in trucks like you could. Um, so yeah, to so to to step it back after Mark with top down view, I, I can I can put put up some slides here and go through a more granular version uh, of of what we sort of arrived at over the the months uh, since you know everything stopped down back in March, and then we started to talk about how would we come back uh, in in the summer of 2020 and and leading up to where we are now. So I've I've sort of done a uh, a roundup that I'll show here. Uh, for everyone to see. Uh, so what you have here is the cover letter from the white paper that the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers uh, put out. And they put this out actually back in June of, of 2020, which was great. Um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty lengthy paper. I've got a, a link up here. Uh, to the website and, and this uh, the PDF of this presentation will be available that Pete's going to make available. But uh, these are these are some of the things, the key takeaways that uh, that we've used and seen and 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 have felt comfortable with, and that I do feel comfortable sending people uh, on, on site under these conditions. So obviously regular periodic testing, um, and 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 again I'll go back and say we, we're starting with starting with masks and social distancing. That's a, that's that's really a given. But, but now moving ahead of that, we're talking about regular or periodic testing. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hope that you're gonna have a test uh, before people get on site. You're gonna have some kind of within 48 hours that they've got a, a negative test. And then if your gig is gonna be you know a week plus long, you would hope uh, that there's gonna be another test in there some uh, somewhere along the line. Uh, and then moving into this concept of equipment like radios and and uh, you know, just being issued to a single person for an exclu exclusive use of the duration. Same thing with comms. Um, uh, but what we, what we realized is that it's not always practical with, with comms, you know, especially in the in the event like what we had with the NBA where there were multiple crews and it's like, well, you can't have, you know, 100 comm drops and then have 300 headsets because you're going to have people rotating. And so that's where we start to move into uh, sanitization and, and sterilization. Um, and just moving through here, you know, cast and crew not leaving the job site during the day, uh, you know, and here in close proximity, wear a face mask or face shield at all times, perform hygiene, you know, before and after the encounter. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the highest standard, but obviously you, you do want to make sure you're washing your hands. Uh, these are things that, that everybody can do again, uh, even if there's no COVID compliance officer. These are just basic things that you can keep in mind, right? And, and see, they're advising against universal blood use. And, and, and I agree, but in the case of if you're a comms tech or if you're an A2, you're handling uh, things that are gonna be touched by people from multiple departments and you're not sure about what the testing is, uh, I would recommend using gloves if you're in that position. Uh, and, and then PPE not considered biohazard waste. That's just sort of something to keep in mind because we were concerned, what are you gonna do with all of these wipes and you know masks now that are throwaway where do they go it's it's the, you know this not only this virus but just other things they don't they don't they don't live on surfaces that long and and you can dispose of you know the same way you would dispose of, a, of tissues when you were sick really is what you want is what we're thinking um personal equipment tools headsets microphone radios clean and disinfected before being used and then at least once per day right that's a, and, and so these are the the topics where we're starting. When possible, use of paper should be minimized, right? You don't want people sneezing and touching things with dirty hands. Uh, and, and also what Mark touched on, stagger, cast, and crew, uh, call times and wrap times, a limited individual number. So, you know, staggering of, hey, you know, let's actually have rigging and lights load in first and then have audio and, 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 and video move, uh, move forward. So that's, um, those are some of the, the, the big takeaways that we had from this, uh, from this white paper and you know so then we then we started to look at well okay sterilization is something that's new you know we we've wiped down you know headsets and, and things like that before with, with wipes and mics everybody's talked about but, but what is sterilization and and how is it different uh from actually sanitization where you're just wiping stuff down and so the only real options as you can see are here on uh, on the screen 
UVC light radiation, ozone, dry heat, uh, and, and steam. So, so, so those, those were where we started. And then quickly we saw, well, okay, do we really want to have oven on site? Do we really want to be having chemicals and steam stuff? You know, ozone is harmful to breathe uh, in certain levels. So, okay, let's, let's look into UV. And that was uh, where we went down. And that, and that led us to doing some of the basic research on, 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 on UV theory, because obviously this has been around in, in medical environments and hospitals and uh, places where you know, they've, they've been dealing with this kind of circumstance for years. So here are the, the basic UV bands uh, that you can see here. And um, as it turns out, 265 nanometer is the true and most effective wavelength for, for germicidal. Um, purposes and you know that's not something that we just made up uh, <clears throat> here's some of the here's some of the information so this is this is the band that we're talking about right in here right far UV or UVC and 280 you know 200 to 280 so this is most effective but as you see highlighted here it will it will affect uh, in, in long term use it will affect plastic and rubber so uh, what is long term? What kind of dosages? And that's that's where we get into uh, a little bit deeper here. Uh, it's 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 a logarithmic effect when you're using UV. So what does that mean? Well, here's some here's some examples. If, if it's known that if you're going to kill anthrax, you know you need the highest you need the highest dosage here, which is log three. And it, you know hepatitis A all the way down to just your basic E. coli. So no one knew where COVID fell uh, on this on this spectrum. Let me jump in here real quick on this. Uh, one important thing to note, and I may not get this exactly right, but cleaning, sanitizing, and sterilizing are not interchangeable terms. Yeah. Uh, it has to do with the decimal point, and I believe log one, log two, and log three. I think log three is sterilizing. I actually think log four is sterilizing. Sterilizing is medical operating rooms, we do not sterilize, uh, and we will never make claims that we sterilize. Um, it's uh, cleaning uh, is a certain, you know, like 99.9% log one. Uh, sanitizing, like I said, I could be off on this a little bit, but uh, uh, sanitizing is, uh, is another decimal of 0 0.9, so 99.99. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, sterilizing, you know, medical grade facilities is four nines, 99.9999. Um, and that is uh, um, just how long you're leaving the UV on at what distance. Um, but it is uh, when we got into the, once we got into UV and we decided, okay, we don't know exactly where COVID is when we started this. We did find out later on uh, where it is. Um, but I think we started with anthrax of, uh, okay, that's the, that's the most durable thing. How much of a dosage does it need? Uh, uh, some of our guys found an actual UV dosage card so that we could prove how long it was, how long it took yeah. in there, not just turn the timer on on the UV oven and walk away and know that we're good, and as Vinny will get into, we learned some very scary things when we first got into this uh, that we would have assumed were okay when, in fact, we weren't doing a darn thing. So Yeah, it, it's true. So we used this simple chart to sort of figure out where we lied, uh, uh, where we were lying at, and, and then we dug into what was going on here. And so what we really learned at is that less than eight feet and the exposure time of 30 minutes, that can get you to approximately a log four reduction. So that's we're like that was that was very encouraging because we we weren't even sure that we were going to be able to deliver a capable dosage of UV. Um, and then w what we realized is, and also was it going to be able to be compliant in, in the time frame? Because if you need four hours to disinfect your mic, that's just not going to work. Um, so, and then we realized things that we are already familiar with, like the inverse square law, you know, applies. Um, and as long as you're, you know. You're below 70% relative humidity, which most of us, uh, most of the time on, uh, on a gig are, uh, you'll be able to have the effects that you need. So 
here's the roundup. You really need to be in the germicidal range for UVC. You want you want 265 nanometer, approximately as close as you can get to 265. Um, the light energy actually disrupts the DNA and RNA. It does not clean, which is what Mark touched on. Uh, it, it, it's 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 actually it's it's providing a service where it's disrupting the, the structure of what of what it is that's uh, causing the infection. So uh, less than eight feet for 30 minutes minimum exposure. Extreme proximity can be as short as 30 seconds. Uh, environmental conditions are narrow. So. And here was the other thing uh, that Mark touched on. So sterilization, 99.999%. That's log six. That's out of that's out of the that's out of the reach of what we would even be able to accomplish on show site, and also uh, not necessary. But uh, log four, log three, log four is about where we want to live. So, um, and then the other point is UV is is additive disinfection. So the item first needs to be cleaned because obviously without the dirt and grime, you can have you can have a virus or bacteria, you can have that stuff living underneath the dirt. The UV will be obstructed by that dirt on that level. You're talking about very small particles here uh, that you're that you're trying to disrupt. So um, and then again, keep in mind that your dose needs to take into account. You don't want to damage what you're actually dosing. Um, and then we learned that UV reflects uh, well off of metal and stainless steel is best. So uh, and 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 uh, you know only consider sources rated for two years of constant use. So what did we do? Well, we wanted to wipe all of our stuff down. We found medical grade wipes that did not contain a high content of alcohol, hydrogen peroxide based. You know, you're going to wipe the stuff down. You're not going to further damage anything that you're already exposing to UV light. Um, so this is one example, but you'll find that there are many examples of. of of what they call sort of medical wipes or gym wipes. Uh, it's the same thing. It, it, it's not damaging to the material, but it will clean, right? It will not will not sanitize. So let, let me let me jump back to to UV. Real, oh, I see you going mm -hmm. with UV here. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that is uh, very important when you talk about like less than eight feet or something is uh, the intensity of the lamp determines everything. Um, so that's where we got into the uh, the UV dosimeter cards, a uh, little three by five card that tells you uh, the exact dosage you get because the the little cell phone cleaners uh, have a tiny bulb in them. Is that a, yeah, that's not the one I'm used to, but sure, Pete, that's a, uh, so it tells you the dosage. You have to decide, uh, and we have decided as a company, what we think uh, the correct dosage is with the Easy Bake Ovens, we actually had uh, a very interesting experience. When we first got them, they put the cards in them and turned the timer on, and after half an hour, the dosage was zero. And we did it again, and it came out, and the dosage was zero. And the question was like, gosh, are our cards broken? Is, is everything wrong? Um, we needed to prove that what we were doing was adequate. Well, after several cards going in there and zero dosage, they actually put them under these devices uh, that Vinny just had up that uh, he'll he'll talk about in a second, and we got we got a dosage. Um, the the UV ovens when they first came out had a plexiglass barrier protecting the lamp. Plexiglass blocks 100% of UV, even though it allows the visual light side of UV through. Um, it blocks the uh, the germ killing side. So just using something, uh, you have to be able to prove what it's doing. So we have used those cards to calibrate uh, the device that, that Vinny has here, uh, has a little uh, circuit in it where you can calibrate the dose on and off. Uh, we can use the cards to let us know that we have to run X amount of time in the oven. We have to run these X amount of time to be effective. Um, I think uh, it's it's scary going into this world of things we can't see, and uh, we were trying to figure out early on. Well, how do we prove that it's killing stuff? You know, do we get a virus and put it on something and try to kill it and send it to a lab? Well, no, that's that's biomedical research. There's no there's nothing you can reasonably do for that. But we can research online that it takes 
X UV dosage to kill anthrax, and then we can prove that we are capable of delivering that UV dosage. Um, and anyone I think who is getting into using UV stuff, if you do not have the little $9 pack of dosimeter cards, you are simply not doing it. You do not know if what is going on inside of that uh, cleaning device is doing anything. Um, so you definitely need to prove whatever technology. There are lots of people jumping into this UV market. Some of them are tested products from reliable companies. Some of them are guys taking uh, a cooler you would take to the beach and putting a UV lamp in it and using it to uh, sterilize hand tools and things like that. So it's it's yeah, definitely so the wild west out there and you need to prove the technologies. And, and thankfully, so this that you see here, the UV Clean is a, is a product that's designed to clean surgical devices, you know, in, in medical settings. So uh, that's that, that's where we that's where we found this uh, in in doing our UV research. This came up, and it was great because uh, you can see here the coverage can be adjusted, right? You can get you can get the height that you need, and you can get exposure. And with this, you can clean. Uh, you know, a, a, a panel, as you'll see here, this is an example actually from the NBA, when the motion, it's motion deactivated. So when someone stops using their panel, they walk away. Uh, this runs for, you know, two minutes and, and you've got now actually a, a sanitized uh, situation. You can still see in this picture, the residue from the wipe um, is still, again, at the end of every day, uh, wiping down every panel to remove you know whatever residues there from people touching a device and then there's the there's the, the uv on top of that um to ensure uh so then that and that also went for uh the headset and so we did use the mt uh uv locker it's, it's one product that's out there there's lots of people as mark said getting into the game uh this one happened to be uh, being prototyped and ready as we were ready. And so uh, it, it turns out that it works out. It's got a 30 minute timer on there. And as we did test with the dosimeter cards, the distance is right so that you can fill that uh, pretty much with, with, with headsets, mics, run it for 30 minutes and you're, you're just above a log three uh, level of sanitization. So again, you're still gonna wipe stuff down and then, you know, you, you want to get you want to get the stuff that people are uh, still talking into directly where they're going to have you know spit and saliva and things like that uh, it's it's I don't want to say settled science but they, they know that okay maybe COVID doesn't spread on surfaces but uh, you know this is this is just general practice you know you, you have flu season you have whatever coming on there's there's no reason to not uh, to not clean first and then uh, Go ahead and, and and sanitize. So and there you have an something uh, uh, along with this. Um, UV only cleans what it directly hits. Uh, foam windscreens, things like that. Uh, uh, it does not. But UV creates ozone as it cooks. So when you close those lockers and put them in for 30 minutes, in addition to the UV, it is creating ozone in there. Uh, which uh, does a level of sanitizing and that gas seeps into things, which helps out also. That does mean when you open it, our practice is to crack open the case for about five or 10 minutes and let it slowly seep out. If you, uh, ozone is also harmful to humans. Um, so uh, you've got to be careful with these things. You know, UV is definitely yeah. harmful. UVC, and, and again, there's a test, there's test strips that you can do uh, for the ozone in the case of the, of the UV locker that we're running, uh, even, at a, even at doses of an hour, it was not harmful. The, it, you know, we, we ran it for, I, I ran the test for three hours and it was not a harmful, uh, what, what, what OSHA considers to be a harmful level of exposure. So- uh, It smells bad. It, it, yeah, well, you can smell it. And that's why we were interested in testing that too. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of products out there. You can take these guidelines that we that we worked with and laid out and experiment for yourself. Uh, but um, these are the things that we've synthesized down to say, hey, this is what 
this is what did work. This is what makes me feel safe. I'm, I'm comfortable handing this out to a crew, telling a producer, telling a client, look, we're, we're, these, are, these are the steps that we're taking to the best information that's available. Um, and, 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 and that's, that's really what I've got. Yeah, it's the big part is all of this stuff is changing uh, constantly um, and it's going to get updated and uh, some of it is opinion, some of it is fact. Uh, some people think the fact is opinion, some people think the opinion is fact. Um, people are, some people don't care, some people care a lot. It's, uh, it's, it's a sticky subject and uh, uh, I'm sure by the time this webinar is done, some of the information is already in, in you know, outdated and changed and, uh, you know, who knows. But um, trying to come up with uh, with basics that we can work with because uh, everyone wants to, to get back to work, but they want to get back to work safely and uh, get back to having uh, again, audio I, you know, problems, I, not, uh, yeah, it, not COVID it, it's problems. It's true. It, it really became apparent quickly that, the biggest job for the comms department was not going to be doing comms. It was going to be cleaning and, and, and sterilization. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the basic, the basic rule that I, that I want to follow is, you know, don't, don't give anything out to a client or a producer that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't use yourself. And that was the thing. And that's what helped me where I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to put gloves on when I touch this, that just came back because, who, who knows where this was? Did they take it to the restroom? Did they, you know, you just don't, yeah. you just don't know. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the bottom line is, is look, look for yourself. If, if, if you're not comfortable with it, then you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't be giving it to others. Yeah. One of the, one of the uh, interesting things you guys kind of kept coming back to as a recurring theme uh, was uh, I'll just sum it up as, Habits are hard to break. Um, not good habits, not bad habits, just how we're used to doing something, right? And this idea of, of muscle memory, uh, you know, immediately going out to a microphone and grabbing it. You're not even, you know, it's not like you're thinking, oh, is this safe, is this unsafe, right? Worst case, you know, I was always worried if it was in a puddle of water, right? Touching something, right? That the this idea of, of breaking habits, um, the the crew you talked about this um in a few different examples where do you see the a2 all right that normally um do do we see opportunities for a2s to to kind of start studying up again not not suggesting that the information here we're not we're not doctors we're not medical professionals heck i'm barely i don't even know if i'm a professional at much of anything but the idea of saying, hey, I'm gonna educate myself, to your point, Vinny, of how, how can I protect myself and then by extension, keep others safe as well. Do you guys have any expectations of where crew coming onto a job site with you? Is there like a minimum base you want them to understand of things before they come out or are you starting them from scratch? I I think for the most part, we're if it's people we haven't worked with, we're saying, hey, one of our senior people or people who's been through this is going to talk you through uh, the process. You know, Pete, yeah, I mean, when you came out and did the VMAs, uh, we had we had a bunch of new tech that you hadn't seen, but eight minutes later, you understood the tech. You know, it's this, yeah, none I mean, of this is rocket science. So telling crew just what I started this off with, you know, you're going to need to wear a mask. You're going to need to social distance. And then when the crew gets on site, we 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 had a similar PowerPoint to the one I just went through, didn't deep dive into the, 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 what was behind it. but it's it's it was it was necessary to talk the crew through because you know somebody comes up with a with a with a calm pack that doesn't work and your instinct is to reach out and take it when really what you want is for them to put it down you want to put gloves on you want to wipe it off and then you want to address the problem and that i, I had to remind crew you know if you've been doing this 10 15 years and you just don't think about it somebody's got a problem you want to spring right to it and yeah okay that's what you're going to do but now you need to take that extra 10 or 15 seconds to just put down, wipe it off, and then move on, you know, put on I a pair think of an, an important thing for crew, if you're hired to a gig, is to start off with uh, the person who called you, hey, what are the COVID protocols? You may get a, oh, yeah, 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 we'll have that covered. You may get an email of a very well put together document. Uh, you may have someone going, uh, oh, you're one of those people. You know, it's, 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 
all levels are out there. And I think, you know, from my standpoint, I want to protect myself. If I don't get sick, I am protecting other people around me uh, to keep them from getting sick. So, you know, I want to take the best care of myself to make sure that I'm not the carrier bringing stuff in um, and understanding things. And, you know, if, if someone, if this would be strange, but if someone actually said, oh, you don't need to wear masks on this gig, I'm not taking my mask off, you know, just because they said that I'm, and I would be very disappointed at any person that we hired that was like, oh, they said we don't have to wear masks on this. You know, we have minimum standards for us. But I think with with crew people, there's going to be a lot of very hard decisions to be made out there. You know, someone offers you a week long gig. You're like, wow, I haven't worked a week straight in in five months. This is amazing. I need this gig. I want to take this gig. I've got a mortgage payment. I need food and stuff like that. And then you find out that there's no safety protocols. And now you're weighing, gosh, that's a good check versus risk. You know, uh, the NBA, as great a gig as it was, we didn't know before we went down there. And I had several guys turn me down who were just like, nope, uh, yes, you're offering three months work, but um, I'm Florida scary. I'm scared of this thing. I, I don't want to go. I don't feel safe. And I was like, absolutely, totally understand that. You know, everyone is making your own decisions and there's no hard feelings on this. And I couldn't answer at the time we were hiring people what the protocols were. They were still being written. No one had done a show yet. So I think it's very important when you're hired to ask the question and keep asking the question because the answer is going to change as you get closer to the gig. Um, a gig that didn't have testing might have testing four days later. So if you're an A2, you know, and you're coming back into this now COVID world, you know, in your in your Pelican or in your toolkit, disposable mask, portable hand sanitizer, gloves, and you know, possibly a face shield. If you yeah. if you if you say yes to a gig and they say there's no COVID compliance officers, you don't have to wear a mask and you really need that gig, you want to you want an N95 mask and you want a face shield. That's it. You got to do what what's going to what you know is going to protect you first, mm -hmm. starting there, and then you can try to expand that out to the to the to the crew and the and the talent and the producers and whoever you're uh, you're working with. Uh, we did it. We did have another tried to uh, instill on on the show Kelly and I just came off of was imagine this bell pack is covered in anthrax Treat it like that right. handle it with gloves sure. wipe it off put it in the charger get it all charged up put it in the uh, UVC and then take it out with gloves and take the headset out with gloves put it in a bag with somebody's name on it all sealed and sanitized and imagine that you're the one you're trying to protect too and the reality is what's frustrating is none of us are medical professionals as far as i know no one that i work with in the entertainment industry is a trained doctor nurse lab tech any of those things that has a specific class they take on infectious disease handling and things like that none of us know the concept of double gloving or washing up to your elbows with iodine for five minutes. You know, all, all of those things that people go to med school and stuff like that to learn, we don't know that. So we have to do the best that we can. In my opinion, when you see someone not doing something, trying to find the, the nicest, most laid back way to say, uh, hey, hey dude, you know, uh, I saw you work with that talent and you didn't change your gloves. You know, a, a big thing now is if you mic up talent, uh, use hand sanitizer on your gloves so that you're not taking something from one person to the next person. It slows the process down. You, you don't have to, you know, uh, you don't know what you're doing. You're, you're an idiot. Uh, don't you know this? There's a lot of people that once you get past mask and social distancing, you're going to surprise them with anything you say. If, if, you go up to someone and say, when you go change the volume on their ear pack or plug the the eighth inch on the ear pack back in, you need to have gloves and a face shield on. They may eventually be like, oh yeah, that does make sense. I went up and I was actually touching them. I wasn't just within six feet, but I was, but they wouldn't get there on their own. They would, that wouldn't be their first, uh, oh gosh, I need to like hazmat suit up and go. So it's, it's reminding people and saying, uh, yeah, you should be doing this. Yeah, you should be doing this. And then if 
if they're not doing it, you got to sort of decide on your own. You know, is this a place I can safely be? You know, can I can I take care of myself and the people immediately around me? Um, it's a lot of tough decisions. Absolutely, and and I think like you guys have alluded to, there's a learning process. So obviously, you guys were in one of the first gigs ever, right? During this pandemic, yep. so you've had months, and as people have come out of um, hibernation to a certain extent and on a show, right? That's their first show, right? And and it, it's part of that learning process. And, and I think some of uh, what I've walked away with um, in some of these experiences has been, uh, um, what, are the, what are the skill sets like you alluded to that we're gonna wanna keep? or perhaps should have been doing, you know, to your point, Mark, the headset piles, right? You know, that was like week two of our webinar series is like, okay, well, this is officially the end of a shared headsets era, right? This has come to a screeching halt. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we found ways to not kill inventory and say, okay, well, yes, somebody is assigned a headset, but we have UV treatment now. So it's not like that man, like you as a as an, a vendor, are going to lose this inventory after one show, right? Um, you know, but on on site, that's a one owner, right? You're yeah. um, better yet, just go buy one. Um, you know, the I uh, think headsets yeah. is a place that my God, 15, 20 years ago, we should have been like everyone on your own headset. I, I, I have never You understood. want to talk about flu or basic I've stuff? I've never understood Ugh. I've never understood wearing rented headsets. I've owned my own headset yeah. for 30 years and the thought that you're putting on a DT108 that somebody's been coughing in for a week. Yeah. yeah so the headset that, I think is a pretty low It was low, disgusting 30 years low ago. Bar stuff, right? And you, now you it's don't have a tough be, time. Now it could be yeah. deadly. You don't no, have a I tough can tell time you that, uh, that uh, at least from our from our uh, vantage, our inventory's never been cleaner. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so I got I have a, a question. The did you find any middle step between those the little UVC devices that you put on individual panels and and the UVC case? There um, are, and, and in fact, there is a question in there. Uh, somebody wanted to know what the what the UV locker costs, and the answer is it's it's scalable. Uh, there there are several vendors that are out there making different devices. Uh, MT made this locker, and depending upon how you outfit it, it ranged between eight and twelve thousand dollars. But they also do offer Pelican versions. So you have the the, the lamps, and then you've got Pelicans. Uh, that you can that you can purchase as well, so you can get from a few hundred dollars all the way up to ten, twelve grand, you know, and more. The thing I would on their definitely website. say with that is test com. it. You know, yeah. Oh, sorry, well, say that again, Pete. Mtcases.com is a good website. Yeah. They'll have those, those things on there, and their current list price for the uh, the the red one you showed is three thousand dollars. The way they're outfitting it now, but they also have Pelican size, uh, fifteen hundred case size. Thing. So it comes in all different sizes. And the desktop one you have is particularly nice. And that's not sold by empty cases, but uh, on on our, our website. Mario will find a way to make money on it. Mario. But, but, I, but I believe yeah. that was uh, the UV lamp is about three to $400. From that, yeah, if I right. Correct. And the interesting yeah. thing but about yeah, that, you can, it's I mean, you can get automated UV devices with conveyor belts and things you know you can spend tens of thousands of dollars if you if, if something you want to put into a shop that you want to go all out you know it's again yeah the, the facility doctors, you can do whatever makes you feel comfortable the facility i've been working at we started off at the beginning back in march where it was just basically masks and social distancing because there were very few of few of us involved um this is a big banking company. They went from 10,000 employees in the building down to 500 employees in the building. And half of that was cleaning staff and security. And our control room that was built to house maybe 15 to 20 people had five people. And we were eight feet apart. We wore masks. We wore gloves. We stopped wearing gloves fairly early on because unless you're changing them all the time, they're kind of pointless as long as you wash your hands, uh, at least in our situation. But now as people are starting to come back, there are more people and we're starting to use wireless mics again. 
we've been for six months only using um, studio mics in the studio and no contact type of things. Now we're back to wireless mics and we are cleaning them. And the A2s are wearing, uh, they're not wearing shields, but they're wearing face masks and gloves. But I think we, it's time to step it up. And, and um, I think getting some sort of UV closet to put the wireless mics in and put compacts in it is the right thing to do. And I, I was just curious about what other solutions you had run into. Yeah, I mean, that I was kind of it. The combo of wiping it down and then, you know, giving it the, the, the UV treatment that seemed to, to tick the boxes that we wanted to tick. Yeah, I, I will say the building I'm working in has the cleanest elevator buttons on earth. There are people standing in the elevator lobbies with cleaning supplies as people come in and push for the button. Somebody goes over and cleans the button. And one of the problems with all of this is if you know anything about uh, sanitizing, sterilizing medical protocols and things like that, you can pick a production apart very, very quickly. Oh, you, know, sure. you can find a thousand places that it's just not working. Um, and uh, that's that's frustrating. You know, yes, it, it, if someone says, well, that's not happening over there, you're absolutely correct. And there is some kind of a balance of first what you are comfortable with if you are freaked out by things you are seeing you should not be there you should leave you should not accept the gig um uh there's i think the stuff that we are doing we are trying to make sure is very safe um uh, we are the the big discussion is you know what gig do you walk off of you know at what point do you look at it and i feel that there's lots of areas not just with covid you can see uh, rigging safety. You can see electrical safety. There's all kinds of things where you're like, wow, these guys are uh, completely out of their minds. It's not safe for our guys to be here. There's cam locks under six feet of water. You know, we got to get out of here. Um, it's tough because with electrical and rigging and things like that, we understand that. We're entertainment technicians. Our brains understand that. Um, where we're calibrated on our knowledge of what is safe with COVID and what is not, when the information you get from doctors varies uh, slightly, I don't think it's changing as much as it did early on. Um, what people are comfortable with is changing. Um, it's very tough because we're not medical professionals. You know, a doctor can look at a situation and go, yeah, that's cool. And, and there's stuff that I've heard doctors say, uh, yeah, that's okay. And then I'm like, wow, really? I wouldn't have thought that was okay. And and they're, you but they're it. infectious disease people. Uh, I'm not going to guess that. Trust too. Correct. Um, but uh, I think one of the big problems is this is a topic that none of us remotely have any training. You know, the research that that our team at Firehouse did was amazing. I know ten thousand percent more about this topic than I did six months ago, and I'm assuming I am only scratching the surface of correct sanitary uh, things uh, and, and what the correct way to do things is. So um, none of us are professionals and it's it's trying to figure out how to uh, to bring an industry back in a safe and responsible way. And uh, there's people that are excited that want to do big gigs. There's people that want to do gigs with audiences right now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are states that it's legal. There are states that you could do shows um, and that's tough. I don't know how, you know, I, for me as uh, a representative firehouse and, and dealing with producers, it's a case by case basis. You know, uh, I am lucky that the clients that we have and the producers that we deal with, I think are very responsible and intelligent and I don't get some of the ridiculous things, but, uh, it, it's out there. Uh, there's plenty of crazy ideas. Um, and, uh, We'll see what happens and we'll see where this goes and what do vaccines mean and what do, uh, you know, yeah. governmental changes and all that stuff. Who knows where we're headed? Vaccines well, and improvements in uh, just regular treatment. I mean, well, really yeah. just rapid result PCR. An accurate rapid result PCR would just make it so that we would definitely be able to operate, you know, safely with, with the protocols that we discussed today in practice. Right. If you just if you know that that that, that it's less likely that COVID's there, you, you you know then what we're doing is is, is holds greater weight.
Certainly, yeah, certainly you're more confident in your own safety. Yeah. So I see a question here around, you know, who is renting UV equipment? Do we know of anyone? And 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 part of that, I, I there you go. Yeah. Call call Mark. Um, uh, the the what I thought was really interesting here, Mark, is that I think you've seen it as an opportunity for your company not to open up necessarily this this UV service, which who knows, but rather to say, okay, here is here is the discipline that that is mine, and that is audio, right? Communications, everything that touches that, and saying I'm gonna I'm gonna formulate a solution here to to not just protect my team, but also bring a sense of safety to the broader organization. And like you pointed out, there's probably little holes, you know, you'll find, there aren't little holes, there are a lot of holes, right? We live in a porous, uh, the production is porous, right? There's just, even in a bubble, it's very, you know, you, you have to go to great lengths to make sure it does not get pierced, right? So, um, Number one, you you do rent uh, UV gear, and as you can see, I, I saw on that like the desk lamps. I think that is one of the coolest, uh, simplest, straightforward, right? You know, when you heard about some of the control rooms where they were installing motion sensing lights, right, so that when the control room was vacant at night, you know, they could cook the room, right, and those kind of things. Let me ask you this: Let's say um, as we see more events come online with people. And the casinos go, hey, we got this great electrostatic system we use or whatever that goes through the casino. We're going to sell that to our clients to, to bug bomb the, the ballroom overnight, right? Or the arena seats or where. Where do you think we start to enter into that conversation to say, okay, hey, who am I talking to? I don't. You know, don't go to the gear with this technology because you're gonna kill I mean, us. At some point, it's a greater, it's a bigger cut discussion because if you're gonna fill a room again with with people, then you've got to have air that's cycled so many times, x number of times per hour, uh, with a HEPA, you know, specific HEPA grade filter, and and potentially, you know, UV treatment in your HVAC. Into, I mean, there's there's that that's that's way about anything that we would be able to, to get Correct. involved. The, the reality is we, uh, we very, a couple of us very briefly talked about, you know, UV services and yes, it's a side business and yes, you could get out there and uh, take a bunch of the technologies and, and probably for a brief period of time, I don't know that this is permanent, but I don't know that it's not permanent. Um, uh, make some money at it. But the reality is uh, we're an audio intercom design company. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the service we provide. And we want to provide uh, the best, safest options for the systems that we put out there. We don't want to become a UV sales company. So finding awesome solutions for our clients and what we're doing, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, buying 70 MT cases and making a business model out of renting them out, uh, it's, it's, we're an audio company. Um, right. And there are lots of companies that are that are pivoting and shifting and and, and doing things, and that's awesome. Um, I just that's, googled uh, I just googled UVC cleaning services. Two pages so far of companies yeah. that will come in and clean your offices on a daily or hourly or weekly basis. Yeah, but I guess here's my question. You know, and some of the stuff I was reading on on the different cleaning methodologies, that conversation where Vinny, like you said, it's kind of a broader conversation, right? Because obviously you've got HVAC systems, you have all this air filtration. It's not our thing, but I think we also have the new challenge of being able to say, okay, if you're choosing to do something else to treat the rest of the room, we need to be alerted to this. So, you know, we can understand what technology they're proposing to use around my front of house console or well, that, around that we've already gotten into. We, uh, right. uh, when this very first started, I actually bought a pair of UVC lamps, uh, at home Depot on a fluorescent housing. And I took a Bolero pack and I took a sure microphone. I took a headset and I baked it under there for like six days just to see if they melted into a puddle of jello. Uh, to try to understand what the, the damages are. And like on the NBA and most shows, we are very specific, no electrostatic cleaning on mixing boards, 
uh, we cover them up. Um, we are handling our cleaning and sterilization. We are not letting the the generic company that is going around with foggers and and whatever tech they have do it because we understand the dosages that potentially damage things and uh, the materials. We haven't so much researched what does damage stuff as what we know is safe because there's right. way too many options out there to figure out, oh, this brand damages a Digico screen, but this brand doesn't. No, we, sure. we found stuff where we're like, okay, we're we're confident and, and safe that this won't damage it. Um, and uh, we basically put plastic or something over our gear if they're coming through with electrostatic sprayers, things like that. And we just say, no, we're not going to get hit by that. Gotcha. What happened with your console, Mac, in the beginning? When it got uh, all crazy with something they put on it. Uh, well, it was something I put on it. Uh, uh, but it, it turned out that it was, uh, that it was in fact, a residue from the wipes. And it was able to be cleaned. But uh, wiping down. So you had to down, clean the cleaner with a cleaner, right? Right, exactly. We, we, we used those oxy wipes. Uh, on the console, and the next day it looked like everything was completely fogged dull. Yeah, and, uh, and that's that's why I uh, had a, a moment a, of panic. Brand so. like the uh, like the Octavir that I listed, something with similar ingredients. Uh, that's what you want. It's yeah, that's that, that's what, that's what we that's similar product to that is what we had. And it, moment of panic for me because we had just installed this new SSL console, and it was brand spanking new. And I wiped it down, and, and way to uh, go, Mac. Came, came in the next day. It looked like I destroyed it, <laughs> but it, it turned out just to be residue, and, I, and it was able to be cleaned. Little, little frightening moment there. Yeah, nice. And I think we addressed this question that came up around the airflow, Bravini. You brought that up and talked about it. You know, again, a lot of things that are out of our control, and I, I really appreciate kind of how you two have focused this down to say, look. There, there's just there's so many things, but start start small. Protect yourself, right? Individually, not selfishly, but rather, hey, if I'm protecting myself, then then indirectly I'm protecting you, right? If I'm wearing this mask, if I'm wiping my hands down with sanitizer, um, you know, and as I move out to the equipment I'm touching, and then, uh, you know, uh, again, not trying to suggest this selfish, hey, I'm just worried about my department but rather it's infectious in a good way. If yeah, I'm worried it, about what I'm doing, hopefully that adjacent person goes, oh, well, this is, that's pretty doable. They, they seem to have a, a, a system that this works, right? And, and hopefully by the time we're done here, um, that, that again, this, the good things spread the same way the bad things do, right? Yeah, um, and, and the fact yeah. is that all of these protocols well, some of them specifically are about protecting the the individual user. They're really about protecting the mass of people present. It's a, it's about it's about preventing the spread of something. And yeah, I and think to, a helmet. Question, we're talking about uh, like the OB trucks and and that sort of thing. There is, I mean, if, if, to me, if you're if you are a truck uh, a vendor who provides trucks. There is a formula you can look at, tells you if the size of the square footage, how how often, how many times the air should be cycled 100% through. It's you know can be six, eight, nine, 12 times in an hour, depending upon the space and and what level of HEPA filter you need to do. Like that 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 stuff works, and that's going to start to come into play if people are going to yeah the, the, the main, care the main thing the HEPA filter. I mean, most trucks yeah. have a lot pretty high turnover of air in the air handlers because there's so much heat producing equipment in there. Yeah, we've been seeing some really great examples of all the all the big truck companies I think have been have been really good at at you know, hey, how are we going to make this work, right? And implementing that air filtration and, you know, yeah, I mean, I started to look at that because as it turns out, you know, in your travel day, actually when you're on the plane, provided that the person next to you is not sneezing right on you, the air in the plane is actually the safest air you're going to breathe the entire time. That air is filtered extensively through a, a, a high quality HEPA. So uh, that, that's that's really what, uh, what truck uh, vendors should be. Yeah, the person next to you sneezing and drooling on you like. doesn't help. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't help some things, right? <laughs> yeah. Other than move them. Um, 
but yeah, that was encouraging to see that study that um, I think it may have been Harvard actually that that just had published that along with some other folks about you know that air filtration and to your your guys's point to recap kind of back to the beginning of this conversation, all this information is changing so rapidly, right? Where entire investigations around uh, a topic that didn't exist a mere year ago, if that. Um, yeah. It is, it's quite the testament to where science has been able to, to assist us here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that, the, the, the diligence you guys have done and also this, this information you shared, um, this is that kind of information, you know, it's always a delicate balance of, Hey, this is what my, my business sells. This is a service I sell. And, you know, I'm not really interested in getting out there and, explain to you everything I do and how I do it. But um, when it comes to life safety things um, and COVID's quickly moving up there, like to use your rigging analogy, you know, it's it's moving up. And we really appreciate you being willing to come in and share what you've found, your experiences. Again, we know you're not medical professionals for anybody watching this video at a later date. <laughs> um, uh, but, the the experience of the this equipment what we're finding from the manufacturers uh like you did mark i would encourage everybody to dig deeper right you're you're while maybe getting terrified on some levels um you're going to find a greater confidence knowing that hey you know what i have a workable plan that can keep me safe that can keep my team safe and um uh, i would certainly never hesitate you know if somebody you know if you're called by firehouse right? You know, you can rest assured you've thought through this, right? Do you have all the answers? You're going to try and find the next answer. I will, I will, I'm pretty confident with that uh, point. Uh, Pete? On Practical Show Tech, uh, back, way back in April, we had uh, our first uh, COVID uh, show with Denise Woodward, and uh, she researched and collected all the links uh, that she could find from manufacturers with their recommended cleaning practices for their equipment. Now, that isn't to say that it, since April, we know everything's changed. There could be more recommendations, but I would hope on the manufacturer's websites, links, they've updated their, uh, their cleaning recommendations as well. Yeah, a lot of manufacturers won't touch this with a 10 foot pole. Um, well, when you ask them about medical questions legally, they do not. They want to be like medical. Nothing to do with medical. What will? What can you clean your stuff with that won't break it? That's right. all they talk about. So if they say don't put alcohol on our equipment, it's because it breaks right. it. We definitely tried to reach out early on, and we were like, "Hey, what should we be doing?" And they were like, "No comment." Yeah. <laughs> we're like, "Okay." Right. We'll uh, figure this well, out. They all have Some have. But, uh, cleaning on there, but the cleaning is yeah. not for medical. It's it's for yeah. for to protect their equipment. You know. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um. Anybody else? Any questions? Thoughts? I'm I'm I haven't even gone anywhere, and I'm ready to go wipe my hands down with hand sanitizer. Exactly. A mask on. I'm by myself in the basement, but you know. Just well, the only reason I don't have a mask on because I am on show site is I'm literally in the back of a coat closet uh, with four walls around me. And so. this is how it works, right? Would you have ever yeah. thought about it in that way? Probably not. You know, eight months ago, no. we wouldn't have been like, OK, I need to go find a room where I can't. It, it's not going to affect someone else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that means it's OK to be in coat closets now, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. With no coats, by the way. <laughs> no so, coats, exactly. Yeah, this is a sterilized coat closet. <laughs> oh, well, guys, thank you so much Living for sharing dream. this. Um, the the information uh, was extremely useful to me. I will tell you that. And I know uh, a lot of the people on uh, that were watching this, uh, um, this is that challenge. And um, thanks for, for helping our industry move forward. Uh, because that's yeah. what we have to do. I mean, they may be baby steps, but we we just have to keep moving forward and we keep finding solutions. That's what we do for a living, right? Uh, I was talking to a producer and I was like, you know, 
you realize this is all we've done all our lives. We solve problems and then we have a show, right? That's what that's what you do. You solve a series of problems, then that is your show, right? And this is the same thing. It's just one more set of challenges that we put together and we do a show, right? So thanks for being on the, uh, the front lines there, guys, helping to uh, develop uh, things that will keep us safe um and uh find us that way forward this this is what everybody in our industry is worried about how am i going to get back to work well this is how you get back to work you totally embrace and understand the situation you're in and come and, and be prepared to live the safest way absolutely and i appreciate you guys uh, doing this because uh we certainly don't have all the answers we certainly are not perfect on site we are working every day but i think one of the only ways we as an industry start to get back to work is by talking about this 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 has to be a topic there's you know 80 or 90 percent of the industry doesn't know and doesn't understand it and we just have to be talking about it and if things are wrong if they're corrected we have that in conversations we we keep things going. You could probably do this exact same thing in two months and it would have different sets of information in it. And that might actually be very useful because this topic here is keeping everyone from working. Uh, I would love to talk about uh, remote intercom. I would love to talk about PA design. I would love to talk about all of those things. That's the fun stuff. This is actually keeping us from working. And the more conversations we have and the more things we can do to inch ourselves forward one step at a time, uh, the better we're going, the safer we're going to be, and the more work we're going to be doing. Yep. One more little question came up. Ryan Trevison asked, "Do you use Oxivar to wipe down comms, belt packs, and headsets?" The uh, the yeah. Oxivar wipes. Yeah, we 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 definitely did, and and uh, honestly, we went with those because they were they fit the bill in terms of what we were looking for to not damage the gear and they were available but by the end of the three month run uh we went through three or four different brands that are similar in in in, in competition uh when you're looking at the ingredients but yes we're using it to you know my thing was to, to wipe down anything that was going to have uh, someone talking into it you know that that was it and 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 in the case of you know belt packs and panels because people are going to sit in a rehearsal for 12 hours you know they're going to have food they're going to have drinks they're going to have tissues they're going to have you know all the things that we know are, are going to happen so um yeah we, we were wiping everything down and then uh yeah. anything that people were talking into directly trying to give that extra uh, bit of uh, of uv uh, sanitization where possible Excellent. Well, terrific. Let's all go get out and work. Yeah, thanks both. Of, thanks, thanks to both of you. And we'll talk about the fun stuff in another episode. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. I can't <laughs> wait. More audio. Yeah. <laughs> More comms. There you go. <laughs> well, everybody, have a great evening. Thank you again, and uh, 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 we'll uh, keep looking for the next topic. And uh, speaking of that, next uh, next Friday. We're back uh, with one more uh, topic, and this one's all around show control and networking with uh, uh, John uh, Huntington, right? John and Huntington. yep, unbelievable. You know, talk about talk about a hot topic. If it has an RJ45, other than COVID, that's pretty much the the hottest topic there can be. Network, 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 and network again. So that'll be next Friday's topic. Join us for that. Order the book read it, be ready for the test. So, okay, everybody have a great one. Good night, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.